All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Kathy Espira. I'm the Managing Director of the Mayor's Innovation Project. The Mayor's Innovation Project is a national peer learning network for mayors and senior city staff, and we work really hard to create meaningful and constructive peer learning experiences for mayors with a focus on small to mid-sized cities, along with other resources that help them succeed as change makers. If you enjoy this type of content, we sincerely hope you'll consider joining us as a member city. Our membership fees are based on city population size and they come with a number of benefits in addition to supporting this kind of work that you see today. And regardless of city member status, all mayors and executive leaders are invited to join us for our summer and winter conferences. Our next conference will be our annual winter policy meeting in DC this January, uh, January 2023. And our agenda this winter will include topics related to political polarization, crisis communications, financing your vision in your city, and equitable solutions for pedestrian safety. We really hope you can join us. Which brings me to today's event. I'm really thrilled to be hosting this important discussion with you today on the discourse of public work. At the Mayor's Innovation Project, we really know that city leaders are working incredibly hard to manage the day-to-day -day tasks of running a city while trying to advance critical city policy. This work is challenging, complex, and rapidly changing in the best of times. We've heard from too many mayors that they face internal challenges that make this work even harder. The infighting and backstabbing that can happen between council, the public, mayor, that can spill over into the media or the courtroom. That is why I'm excited to host this conversation today. I first heard about Mayor Spano's work on this topic at our winter meeting earlier this year. And during our innovation showcase, Mayor Spano spoke about a process the city had implemented to focus on relationship building, empathy, and trust amongst policymakers. And he spoke not just about that, but about the ways that it improved not just council meetings, but had co-benefits for public interactions, staff retention, and the cost of public meetings, the things that really impact your day-to-day -day job. I thought it was interesting, and more importantly, the mayors in attendance really wanted to know more. I have never heard more follow-ups, and hey, do you did you hear that thing <laughs> from mayors after the session and in the, the months afterwards by email and phone? So that brings us to today's discussion. I'm excited today to welcome our three speakers, and I'll introduce them briefly and open the floor to them in the order in which they will, uh, they will speak and in the order in which I will introduce them. We'll hear from each of them before we open up for questions, but feel free to add questions in the chat and I'll start to queue them up as we go and, and, um, and uh, call in you as we head to discussion afterwards. We will have time for discussion. A note that we're recording these presentations, but we'll end the recording when we get to the Q&A just to encourage candid and off the record discussion. And I will be sharing the presentation slides after the session with you all. So now I will uh, introduce our speakers briefly. Mayor Jake Spano has served as the mayor of St. Louis Park, Minnesota since 2016, having served on the city council since 2012. He is a faculty member teaching executive leadership and graduate studies at Metropolitan State University in St. Paul. Before this, he served as deputy secretary of state for the state of Minnesota and was in senior leadership roles for St. Paul Mayor Chris Coleman and U.S. Senator Amy Klobuchar. He is co-founder of Minnesota Mayors Together, a diverse coalition of Minnesota mayors working to break through the urban-rural divide and return the state to shared prosperity. Tom Harmoning served, as, served the city of St. Louis Park, Minnesota for 26 years, first as its community development director and then as city manager. Tom's areas of expertise revolve around organizational culture and development, leadership, economic development and redevelopment, and building positive relationships. And finally, Kathy Eccles, is an associate at Essential Partners, an organization that for 33 years has worked across the globe to give people the means to strengthen relationships, deepen belonging, and renew hope in their communities. Kathy has helped multiple communities establish civil discourse programs that taught dialogue design and facilitation skills to nonprofit, religious, government, and higher ed organizations. Welcome everyone and, and welcome Mayor Spano and Tom. I'll kick it over to you. All right. Uh, thank you, Katya. And um, uh, thank you to all that are participating and, and viewing this presentation today. It's a real pleasure for us to be here. A little housekeeping. Um, the mayor and I have 25 minutes to uh, present, which for those of you who know us, that is far, far too short. Um, yeah, two and a half hours maybe would be would be better, but we'll do our best to stay within 25 minutes. We have just a few slides. We're gonna walk through them fairly quickly. 
Jake and I are going to tag team. Um, at the end of this uh, presentation and Q&A, we hope that you uh, understand the importance of culture. We're going to talk a lot about culture today and creating or maintaining a high-performing city council and come away perhaps with some ideas or tools that you can use in your own organization. Obviously, the underlying purpose of all of this is to make sure our citizens have the best local government possible. Uh, next slide, and Jake. Mayor, you're on mute. Thank you, Katya. You know, it's only been two years. And we're still, and I'm still doing that from time to time. So appreciate it. Um, yes, as Tom said, we're going to uh, cover a lot of ground today. So I'm going to get right to it. Um, we want to start though with a little bit of a level set about why we're even talking about sort of like community culture and civic culture in an organization. And we've all heard the adage, right? Culture eats policy for lunch. Um, and that's because culture is the singular most important thing that drives your organizational success, right? It is the values and it is the norms and it is the mindset of the people who serve uh, the city in their sort of elected capacities, but also for staff that work at the city. Um, and I would also say, Tony, Tom, and I would say that it also uh, impacts your community's uh, sort of culture and mindset. So why is it important? I think there's Really, there's a lot of reasons that culture is important, but the three that I sort of think about most frequently is, I think it drives people, right? It drives people both in terms of who might run for council uh, and be on your council, but it also drives the sorts of people who might want to work in your city, right? Uh, Tom and I have talked about this before on, on several occasions that, you know, every time you're sitting down with a, a future police chief or community and economic development director, uh, for a job interview, um, they are interviewing you as much as you're interviewing them. And if you think that they haven't gone online and watched videos of council meetings and read meeting minutes and, and called people who maybe have worked in that city to talk to them about the culture, I mean, you just, that's just a, that's just a given, right? That they're checking into, uh, what's that workplace culture going to be like for me, right? So, for a lot of us, I think it is a competitive advantage, right? Having a positive and productive um, community culture and, uh, and a high performing team between your council and senior staff in particular, um, makes you an attractive place for staff to come and, and work and then hopefully to stay. Um, I think the most important reason that we wanna talk about culture though, is because the people who are on this call, whether you are senior staff members or you are mayors or what have you, you are both the keepers of and reflectors of the culture of your community. And um, it's your responsibility to uh, take what you've been given, make it just a little bit better um, as you move it forward. And I think that for us, one of the things we just wanted to remind folks that acknowledging that your community has a culture and that your city council has a culture um, and making an affirmative commitment to build on that and improve it is really the first step in, in all of the work that we're gonna talk about. So with that, Tom. And next slide, please. So in front of you is a, a Venn diagram that uh, Mayor Spano and I prepared that uh, identifies the key ingredients that uh, St. Louis Park has identified over time that has allowed for a healthy culture to uh, grow and sustain itself over, over the years. Um, those three areas are governance, self-awareness, and relationships. And as you can see, the sweet spot is culture. So those, those three ingredients uh, make up the recipe and culture is the is the byproduct of that uh, and a healthy culture uh, at that. Uh, it wasn't always this way. I mean, it's taken time, um, uh, you know, for St. Louis Park to, to evolve how it's gone about creating a healthy culture. Um, this is what has worked for St. Louis Park. Um, it, you may not have the same uh, specific ingredients, uh, the same exact ingredients in, for your community. Uh, and that's okay as long as you end up in the same place. That in the Venn diagram, however those three circles are identified, 
that center sweet spot, that culture um, um, uh, is in place. And, and I, as, I, as I've said before, ensures the best possible outcome for, for your uh, community. Um, Jake, I'll turn it over to you on governance. Yep. Next slide, please. Yeah, next slide, yep. So <clears throat> I wanna talk a little bit about some of these components. We've touched on culture. I wanna talk about governance now, but I wanna to sort of start with what governance isn't, right? Um, Tom and I were in Oregon at a conference and, and asked this question in the, you know, I asked sort of what is governance? And I got a lot of, there were a lot of hands that sort of said, it's the council manager form of government or it's the strong mayor form of government. And, um, and we said, no, it's, it's, that's, that's your form of government. Um, it's not that, it's not your rules of procedure. It's not Robert's rules of order. It's not those sorts of formal structures. Um, what it really is, is it's all of the gray areas in between all of those structures. Um, it is clarity, um, it is language, it is behavior. And so uh, when I think about um, governance, uh, I think about it in those sort of three areas, right? It's clarity about the roles. And that means what are the roles that we have um, as elected officials and senior staff? Um, a lot of times we talk at, uh, in St. Louis Park, we use kind of the, the uh, sort of visual uh, reference of above the line and below the line, right? We talk about you know, sort of imagine a piece of paper, draw a horizontal line. Everything that is above that line is the what are we doing and why are we doing it? That's counsel, that's policy, that's the policy makers, right? Um, below the line is how you do it. And that's city staff and your city manager. And it's very important to know what your role is relative uh, to the organization. And it doesn't mean that um, a council member might not go below the line, right, and talk about how we're doing something or have suggestions on ways to make how we're doing something better um, or vice versa. Um, but I do think that, number one, you know, being intentional about naming it when you are uh, crossing that line is important. And, um, but also sort of remembering that you don't, you don't cross the line and stay there. You might want to cross that line to point something out or to make a suggestion, but you really need to understand your roles uh, between council and staff, but also roles between council members, right? Uh, for example, we uh, spend quite a bit of time uh, making sure that we set sort of norms and and um, uh, sort of unwritten rules about, uh, or I shouldn't say unwritten, but maybe less formal rules about who's doing what. For example, in my community, generally speaking, if a media request comes into our, our city, that's usually something that I handle. Um, understanding that um, is important so that uh, everybody knows uh, who's doing what uh, when we get those sorts of requests. Um, it helps us to provide greater clarity to our language, right? What is big bowl versus small bowl? Sometimes what we will refer to is if somebody's getting in the details that really aren't in the council's purview, we might say, you know, that feels like it's a little small bowl to me. Um, let's stay in, in the big bowl. Let's talk about land use. Let's be talking about, um, you know, variances. Let's not be talking about paint colors and things like that. Um, and then I think the last part that governance really impacts or, or, or is informed by and, and uh, has a relationship to is behavior, um, the sort of interpersonal behavior that goes on uh, between members of the council. And that's really where our norms work that we will talk a little bit more about later is so critical because we establish a set of guidelines that fill in those uh, gray spaces about things like um, you know, focus on policy, not on personal issues, right? Um, things like assume the best intentions from your colleagues. Um, uh, listen to be, uh, you know, we want to listen to understand uh, versus listening to respond. Every community will have their own kind of norms, um, but establishing those and making sure everybody has a common agreement that they will abide by them will resolve a lot of challenges. It won't keep you from getting into tricky spots, but it will make it easier because you'll have a shared language. And I would say as a mayor, it really kind of gives you a good rule book for when you get that call from a, a city manager or maybe another council member with concerns about uh, something that somebody might be doing, it, it sort of gives you a, a little bit of a rule book to go back to. So that's 
uh, kind of governance as we define it. So, Tom. I'll talk a little bit about relationships. Um, you can go back a slide. There you go. Thank you. Uh, I hope we all agree that solid relationships are are really important to ensuring you have a healthy organization, a healthy team, a healthy city council. Um, we view uh, there being four kind of pillars of healthy relationships. Uh, trust and respect are two of those. I view those as kind of the what. Um, and uh, the other two pillars are communication and intentionality, which are kind of the how. Good communication and being intentional about working on your relationships leads to trust and respect. Um, in my mind, trust is most important. Um, uh, as you probably all know, trust uh, can take a while to build. It can, it can be gone in a second uh, based on uh, what you might do or what has happened. Um, from an internal perspective, uh, to help build that trust amongst city council members and senior staff, a major focus has been given to what we call relational learning. And Jake is gonna talk a little bit about this uh, later. Uh, relational learning is really about understanding yourself and others. Um, in St. Louis Park, uh, there, we've used various tools to help with relational learning, things like uh, uh, True Colors, you may have heard of that. The Gregoric is something that we use to start our relational learning some time ago. And conflict is also something that we spend some time learning about as well, uh, learning about each other and ourselves. And we've used the, uh, the uh, Thomas Kilman conflict mode instrument to identify our conflict styles, our dark sides, uh, how we react when we're under stress, those kinds of things. And, and we share that information uh, or that information was shared so that I understand Jake's style and uh, how he might react in a, in a typical situation and he'll understand how I might react versus us assuming or making uh, some false or getting false impressions about what's really going on. Uh, open and honest communication, obviously critical to that trust. Um, I always appreciated staff being honest with me about, you know, when something didn't go well, you're gonna build my trust when you tell me, uh, you know, that just didn't work out very well versus making excuses or trying to hide it. I think the same thing goes through is true with the city council. They need to be honest with each other and have um, open communication, healthy communication, and, and are equipped to do so, so that um, that trust can be maintained even during really difficult times, because there will be difficult times. Um, so trust, respect, open communication, and in, intentionality are some things that we really try to stress. I think Jake's gonna talk a little bit about self-awareness. Yep, um, and I, I think Tom sort of, at the end of his comments talked, you know, talked about that self-awareness and humility. And, and I think that that's an important place to start, right? Which is to understand that this isn't about you. You know, you are not the office. Um, you are the temporary office holder. And so uh, it's important to remember that this is about your community and what's best for them. Uh, versus you winning or losing. And that's hard to do. I, I mean, look, I have an ego. We all have egos. We all want to be right. We all want to win. Um, we all have important things that we want to get done for our community. But I think for us to be effective as community leaders, we have to have a long range view of our relationships and our role. And so I always try to remind myself, like, I'm not the mayor. I am currently the mayor. Um, which is a, a difference that may feel like it doesn't have a distinction, but it has an important one. But I think it, it's important because it also builds this piece around self-awareness and allows for, as Tom said, more honest and open and effective communication. Um, and that allows you to build relationships and connect with one another. And I'll just give you a, a short version of a, a recent uh, um, situation that came up in my community. Um, I'll, you know, redact the names to protect the innocent, so to speak, but name myself, right? Uh, we were having a council meeting here a couple uh, months ago, two, three months ago, and one of my colleagues, um, I felt, uh, was not being respectful, and I uh, called him out publicly 
Um, and now I did not yell and scream at him. I simply, you know, sort of said uh, that I felt he wasn't paying close attention and that I wished that he would pay closer attention because I had paid close attention to his remarks. Um, and, uh, you know, so I tried to be as polite as I could about it, but it was clear uh, if you watched it that I was not happy and that I did that publicly. And I felt uh, as soon as it had happened that that was a mistake. I had violated one of our norms, which was to focus on the policy not on the personal, and I had made it personal. So before we got to the next council meeting, I, I pulled him aside and I said, I want to apologize to you. I lost my temper last week. And I, uh, I think I embarrassed, may have embarrassed you. I certainly felt like I had embarrassed myself. And I wanted you to know that I apologize. I shouldn't have done that. I broke one of our norms. Uh, I made it personal. Um, and I just wanted you to know that uh, I was going to talk about that tonight at our uh, at our community, or rather at our city council meeting, when a televised meeting uh, during communications. I'm going to bring this up and apologize. Um, and uh, and he was very gracious, and he said, you know, I appreciate that. I was sort of scratching my head. I wasn't sure what that was all about. Uh, can you tell me more about like why did you uh, why were you so upset? And and I explained that I thought that he had violated one of our norms. Um, and we had a great conversation. Fast forward to the meeting, end of the meeting, and I just said, you know, for those of you who may have watched our council meeting last week, you saw that I lost my temper with my colleague and uh, pointed him out. And I said, you know, I apologized to him uh, privately, um, and I'm apologizing to him here publicly, but also to my colleagues, because one of my roles as mayors is to model our best behavior, and I did not do that last week. Um, and I need to be better. But more than anything, I want to apologize to our residents because you deserve better from the people who serve you than what I gave you last week. And uh, and my colleague actually said, you know, uh, well, you know, I, I thank you, you know, appreciate the mayor's comments, but, you know, a little bit in his defense, like I also had, you know, maybe wasn't paying as close attention as I should have, and it's a good lesson for all of us, right? And so um, it, it probably feels a little bit like a kind of, you know, trust uh kumbaya moment. And it was a little bit, and that's okay. Uh, frankly, after the last two years, I think, uh, or three years, you know, uh, our, our communities are looking for more of those moments uh, from their colleagues. Um, and it wasn't about kind of hugging it out as much as it was about holding ourselves accountable to our agreements, right? Uh, to our norms that we spend time uh, and, and, and are very intentional about working on. And so I'm proud of the fact that I had a moment where I could sort of step back and, and call myself out um, it's easy to call others out. It's harder to call yourself out. Um, and I really appreciated the fact that my colleague was able to listen earnestly and reflect on what uh, his part of that uh, interaction had been and then to name it for himself. So I think those are, uh, that is, that self-awareness is really, really important to relationship building um, and protecting kind of the, the investment that your community has made in a high performing team, uh, which brings us to the the last piece, right, which is about an investment. So you can advance the slide if you uh, if you care to. Um, so we've talked about all these pieces, right? We've talked about culture. We've talked about uh, you know relationships. We've talked about self awareness. All of these things. Um, those are all ingredients um, or Legos, right? And Legos with no instruction manual is just a pile of stuff that you step on in the middle of the night and causes you excruciating pain uh, when you're walking through your living room. Um, uh, but when you have a method by which you can take those ingredients and bring them together uh, with your team, um, that's really something that's special. And that's the thing that we wanted to really you know, sort of share with you all, with, which is uh, begin sort of with a question, which uh, people don't have to obviously answer it out loud, but just think to yourself, how many of you uh, invest money and time in professional development for your staff, right? Like I do. Uh, our city does, I should say, um, but not as nearly as many cities invest time and money in the council's professional development in making them an effective and high-performing team, especially as it relates to their senior leadership. And it's been our experience, which Tom and I did not, you know, we didn't invent this notion of doing sort of relational retreat work on an annual basis. But we absolutely are the benefactors and have been the benefactors of it. And so we just wanted to really make clear that taking time out of your year every single year um, to go on a retreat, and this is not what some people sometimes call a strategic retreat. Those tend to be more focused on some specific policy areas that you're going to work on in that year. This is a relational retreat. 
um, and it does not prevent you from having challenges in the future. Um, but what it does do is it provides an opportunity for your team to get together and talk about what works, what doesn't work, what are those norms, what are those rules, what are the agreements that we're all gonna live by as we do our work. So it's not about what you're gonna work on, it's about how you're gonna do your work. Um, and very briefly, I will just say, there's lots of ways to structure this, but for St. Louis Park, it's evolved over time. Um, but most recently, the way we sort of do it is usually four months or so out, three, four months out from our retreat date, uh, which we have at, uh, just after the beginning of the year, um, myself and another council member, along with a couple of staff members, will begin having conversations about what's going to be the, the focus of our retreat. What do we want to work on? And we will survey our colleagues on the council and just ask for their feedback. Staff will uh, have conversations with staff. And we kind of come together uh, and say, you know, here's what we're hearing this year that we really need to, to focus on. Uh, and maybe it is, I'll make something up, maybe you have uh, three new members of the council, right? Um, and so uh, there's going to be a lot of work that's going to have to happen around governance, right? And making sure that they understand as a new elected, newly elected official, what is their role? Um, because sometimes they come in and they think they're going to do the hiring and the firing and they're going to decide how the roads are plowed or potholes are filled. And, and so you might want to focus more on that, but we will come up with a two-day plan and it always involves sort of three basic areas, governance, norms and relationships, and then we will usually have a deep dive on a, a, a bigger, could be a bigger governance area, or it could be a, a community-wide issue that might be coming up, like let's say you're going to do a big uh, community survey that year. We do one every 10 years or so. Um, you might want to do a, a really deep and intense uh, conversation on that. So Sometimes it's facilitated by uh, internal staff, but usually it's a combination for us of having some internal staff, but then also bringing outside experts in. Uh, I think having, uh, we think at least that having uh, people who maybe have a bit of a fresher view on the organization and the dynamic is can be really, really helpful, number one. Number two, there are areas that you may want to dig into, as Tom was mentioning before, you might want to have somebody do a Myers-Briggs personality inventory or the Strengths Finder or True Colors. Um, those uh, resources are all uh, usually done by people who are practitioners in those areas. You really need to be an expert in it. So you want to bring in people who are uh, really, really um, proficient in those areas to walk your team through that. So I think the, 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 the retreat uh, and making this decision that you're going to make an investment in your team's culture um, and performance and relationships is really what we wanted to, uh, to drive home here. And Tom, I, I don't know if you've got some, some thoughts on that as well. I think you nailed it, Mayor. Stuff the landing, as they say. Um, all right, you can advance to the next slide. That's it for really from us, uh, Tom. As I said, unless there's anything that I left out you wanted to, to emphasize, um, we wanted to try and move through this fairly quickly so we can have a conversation about it and, of course, answer questions. The only, the only thing I might add, Mayor, is just to re-emphasize uh, why uh, doing this type of work is important. Uh, it may seem touchy-feely to some, you know, let's, let's talk about business, let's not uh, spend time on this. But in the end, the reason you're serving as a city council member or as a city manager or senior staff person is to serve the community. And if you're not hitting on all cylinders as a council and staff, you're doing your community an injustice. You're wasting their money, uh, your dysfunction, if you are dysfunctional, has a direct impact on the community, its reputation, who wants to work for it, and who might want to run for office. So this is really important work that I've seen bear fruit uh, uh, during my many years in St. Louis Park. So thank you. Just a quick note. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Tom. Just a quick note that we're going to hold for questions until after Kathy's presentation. Um, so feel free to add them to the chat. So that we can queue them up or just I, I am noting if you raise your hand or express interest and I'll, I'll start with you when we're ready. And with that, I'm going to kick it over to Kathy 
um, and change the pins here while you get your presentation loaded up. To reflect on the comments from Mayor Spano and Great. Tom. Great. Can you see that? Not yet. Oops. <laughs> Okay, I can see it. I think you, yep, there you go. Good. Great, got it? Great. So uh, thank you so much for the chance to be with all of you. It is so exciting to be with mayors who think about how the relationships of the council, how you interact, impact your community at large. Um, Watching you in all that you, in how you do what you do, I think is like the model and inspiration to your community about how they can interact with each other to actually live and work better together. Um, this is uh, the work of Essential Partners is really about helping communities have the tools to have those conversations, both uh, in councils, in small organizations, in communities, uh, we work with civic organizations, institutions, higher ed, city governments, and, and have us to help communities establish a lot of um, civil discourse programs that really help uh, the community at large, as well as the leaders, uh, have the kind of conversations that um, really engage people from a place that is open-hearted and open-minded versus defensive. Um, so my time here is I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, a lot about how and um, what kind of work has been done and and give you some tools in terms of that you could use either internally um, with your staffs or also uh, in your communities at large. So uh, we use a process called reflective structure dialogue. That's what RSD stands for. It's a framework actually that helps people actually speak in a way that they can really connect to personal experience, ask questions from a really curious place, not be reactive, and really start to shape a space where people can listen, inquire, and um, really reflect on what's being said. We worked with communities. Um, uh, kind of across the globe as well as across America. This happens to be um, folks in uh, Howard County, Maryland, who really wanted to work on issues around faith and around race. They started with uh, uh, some leaders wanted to get together. They Five of them worked for a very long time thinking about how do we actually include the community. Ultimately, they've had more than 500 people uh, engage in conversations that really help them embrace diversity versus uh, uh, separate from each other. This is an example of some work we had done in um, Ohio and Oberlin. I see one of you is here from Lorraine. And um, where the city council had actually been working on, you know, shall we renovate or shall we rebuild a school? And the city had gone on for about seven years, not really deciding about it. And some of the community came together. They had worked with us on a sort of long program around how to engage people in the conversation. And ultimately, then the city council and the community were able to have a deep heart to heart conversation about um, what do people really want and what what um, and how should they proceed? How is all of it affecting people in terms of their capacity to learn and work together? Ultimately, they build a new school. This is another example of, you see this uh, art piece in the center here where the community, somebody said, we want to place this piece of art in a particular place. It caused a lot of uproar, uh, social media, lots of vitriol. Probably you've had ex some experience of that somewhere in your communities. And, and the work that we did in this one was about helping people look not at how to how to have a yes no what should we do but to actually start to think about how to reframe um, what the concern is so that people can engage from it from multiple perspectives and so that the 
problem is not about should we, but it's actually about where do we have structure and the support to do it. Ultimately, this project turned into um, engaging uh, the city and art and cultural leaders, the community at large, and um, looking at what kind of structure needed to happen inside of inside of the city, what kind of resources, and then actually inviting the community at large to fill in what it is that they were actually hoping um, would be a part of this policy. And so if I come back to what um, Jake and Tom have talked about in terms of the importance of relationships, we would say this is central. It's the very thing that holds everything together. Um, we look at how can we create a structure or shape for that will support a conversation where people share their life experience that helps inform their their perspective. So there's space for all kinds of perspectives. What do people actually value? What's at the heart of the matter? What are the kind of tensions they're experiencing? So that in a conversation of people who may not know each other at all, um, or in the be best benefit of the world, when you think about your council, actually spending time to actually understand each other deeply, um, that's ideal. But in your communities at large, you may not have that opportunity. But when you, when you shape a place for people to speak deeply from the heart and clearly with a strong purpose that you help people build relationships that then helps folks start to learn together and align their perspectives so they can actually accomplish what they truly intend. But this relationship part is essential to an ongoing um, uh, community that thrives. So we think about when you talk about um, everything that uh, uh, Jake and Tom have talked about here in terms of really getting to know each other, which is ideal. When you think about your community at large, you have all sorts of people coming into conversations with you um, that have different values and motivations, traditions, history, styles. Um, and, and basically, they don't necessarily know each other. And there is a tendency, we are hardwired in this world to survive, to actually think the world is a dangerous place and I need to fight, flight, or freeze. And so we think at Essential Partners about how can we shape a, um, how can we do something that actually makes a place for people that that instead of closing down in this place of threat, how can we open it up? Um, when we fall into that sort of smaller perspective of, um, of can, I'm going to call it the visual cycle, where it's the same old conversation, the same old taking up space, not listening, the trying to prove your point, um, nothing happens that's good. Um, a community starts to fall into what we call this attack, defend, trigger, vigilance, and it goes around and around. And when we look in cities overall, we see that that place where if people feel like there is not necessarily a place for them to be heard and in their different perspectives and their different values and their different identities valued and that there's a place for them, then you start to see these separations and polarizations which lead people back to what we would call sort of behavior that looks a lot like threat and not so much access to what their honestly, it's good sense of humor and their wisdom is. So we're looking about how do we actually do that? And so some of the ways that we see that people can break that cycle, um, both either in your council or in your community, is we're saying this, how can we actually pause um, Use a framework or some tools to pause, slow down, suspend judgment, like let ourselves actually have shared discomfort where um, we can just sit with our unease, notice, notice, be able to be observant as Jake was really so observant before in terms of naming something and talking about it with somebody to be curious, to ask, to listen, to invite um, and I'm hurrying because they gave me seven minutes while they had 25. So um, we think about um, how do we create safe enough spaces where people can actually risk being themselves, risk speaking honestly, 
risk being curious and um, be able to, again, what I would call live through that shared, shared discomfort. And so we work with communities to help them learn how to both uh, facilitate a dialogue, to learn what dialogue is and how to facilitate it, how to design it and facilitate it. And so it's a process that's going to reduce that, that uh, inclination to, you know, act in a way that looks like fight, flight, freeze, and actually instead um, create a space where people actually can ask questions. And so the structure that we work with um, really is really welcome, uh, kind of why are we here? What's the purpose of our time together? Um, Jake talked about communication agreements, or you call them a kind of a shared language. We would use those too in terms of proposing and letting the group themselves actually decide what they want those to be. So that's, that's their commitment to each other. We invite people to introduce themselves, not from what their um, not from what their pedigree is, but rather from what they what they care about, what they what values to them, and then we seed we seed uh, situations in conversations in a way that we invite people to sh share um, share deeply on a topic in a very short focus space, and then open it up for people to ask questions, and then sort of notice what they discover. This this structure actually. Um, makes room for a discovery and uh, what we would call sort of shifts that when you start to see people actually have more empathy and trust and to connect and repair communities that have struggled together. And from that place of what I call shared humanity, people can actually really think together about how they can actually include and support one another and do that from a place and accomplish what they've come for in a place that really stands on relationship. And so we start to set up what we call a very constructive cycle of communication. And again, these slides will come to you, but some of the tools that you can actually just pull into your own council meetings or the way that you interact even when you bring the community into you is you can set up communication agreements that are, they're behavioral. It's not, you know, so you'd be able to demonstrate them. Uh, don't make assumptions, ask questions, not to interrupt, those kinds of things. Um, invite really personal uh, connects among people, but take the time to connect before you move into contact. Content, um, we set time limits, we invite people to, pause to gather their thoughts before they speak and truly hold to time limits, take a kind of breath between people um, and and then make space for real curiosity. And we oftentimes uh, have a facilitator that actually helps people stay in the commitments of both the purpose that they've come there for and also to maintain the, the agreements they've come in terms of how they will show up with each other. These are examples of communication agreements that we uh, invite people to sort of riff off of and establish their own. Um, and then this is an example of a kind of a connecting at a personal level. We would, you know, in let's say you have a small group of people, it's their opening conversation might, you know, what do you cherish about our community? What do you think is at risk about our evolution? And then, and then share something that helps us better understand, let's say in the case of US City Council, what you bring to your work as a city council member. And so um, I know this has been like on roller skates probably for you, but please know that there are, um, when you get the slides, these are, you can click on here for impact stories, for resources that are available to you for the, ways that we actually support people through um, real culture change and how you could work with us uh, at Essential Partners. We've, uh, we're in the midst of, um, I'm, many of my colleagues actually are in the midst of this, but right now we're, we've just started a new project in Sandwich, Massachusetts. Last year, um, the community of Wellesley actually started a civil discourse um, project. And I do wanna say that uh, I see the, the most positive impacts when leadership of a city really says yes to having a civil discourse, uh, a really connected way of having conversations with each other. When you support that as city leaders, 
in your for your in and for your community, it can happen. And um, there are so many formal and informal leaders across your community that people connect with and are inspired by, and and that uh, serve as models for how we can actually really care about each other and and work and live better together. So I, I thank you very much.